Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Pasord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in central London. Today I'm talking to Nick, who's an Asian gentleman whose son developed a major and serious mental illness. Nick, how did it all begin? What did you first notice as being a problem with your son? First notice is very, very uh, minor examples of odd behavior. We have a downstairs toilet. Um, he, he went in there once and I heard him uh, using a hammer on the door. I mean, at that time it was nothing for me. So I went and asked, uh, what are you doing? No, Dad, I'm trying to this or that. So I said, you know, don't do anything with it, leave it. And then sometime later, of course, he started, he went to, when he went, after he went to university, when he came back, we noticed certain funny behavior. He used to go out only at night. He, he, he thought the uh, stuff in the fridge, refrigerator was all poison. He wouldn't touch it. Odd things like this, you know. There are many examples which are too detailed to go in. But that's how it started. And then we, this odd behavior made, uh, made us uh, go and see the GP. And the GP referred us to a very prominent psychologist, psychiatrist. He interviewed him in my presence uh, for about 15 minutes and he said, nothing wrong with him, send him back to university. So he went back to university. And then there we noticed certain things happening. He was at Nottingham then. Uh, he was working part-time in a, in a video library shop, a library outlet. And one night he rang at 10 o'clock and said, Dad, there's a Chinaman out there waiting with a baseball bat. And uh, similar sort of statements followed. He said, that is the... Um, uh, British, this right-wing party in the library watching watching me all the time. This odd behavior like that, very, very paranoid behavior. So eventually I went and brought him back from Nottingham. Um, then after some time we engaged him at a Middlesex University. Similar sort of thing happened. He wouldn't stay at one place. I mean, he used to move from one room to another room in his houses. Uh, every 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 month or so, eventually bought a house near the house, near the campus, you know, two minutes walk from the campus, and uh, he was he stayed there on his own. And there one day he rang um, sometime in sometime in the end of July, I think he rang and said, "Dad, I want to come home." I said, "Okay, uh, uh, why don't you come? Will you come by by underground or rail?" He said, "Okay." But he went to the station and he rang, I can't do it, I'm afraid to go on the train. So I went and picked him up. When I went to see him, he had barred him, shut himself in the front room and put something against the door. And, you know, only when I opened it, I noticed the room was in darkness. He had drawn the uh, curtains, everything. And then he was sweating and in the right, absolutely very terrified state. Uh, anyway, so. I brought him home, uh, and about a week later, he attempted this, uh, you know, slit his throat. That is what, how it happened here. What do you mean by he slit his throat? Well, well, when we saw him in the bath full of water, his throat was, uh, the flesh was hanging out from his throat, and then, you know, uh, I don't know how much of blood he lost, but he had to call the ambulance straight away. But he locked himself in the bathroom and made yeah, a serious was, suicide was, attempt. Yeah, yeah. I was able to, because I had, I was doing some work on the flat roof, adjoining the bathroom, I had left one of the windows open, so I was able to get him through there and then rescue him, you know, otherwise he would have, I don't know, lost more blood, I suppose. Did anything happen just before this incident that would have alerted you that something was seriously awry? No, no, you see, these things creep up on you. You don't realize that something really bad happened. Even the, when a clinician tells you, a top grade senior house, house officer tells you, there's nothing wrong with it, it's all your imagination. Your son is perfectly okay. What do you want us to do? We don't know a thing about mental illness. And this lady says, your son is okay, send him back to university. It's all your imagination, fertile imagination, whatever it is she was saying. So what do you do? You think you, you are in the wrong. And that, my son was able to convince the, that lady that he was perfectly okay. Where he wasn't eventually. Even after that, even after all this, um, you know, suicide attempts and began to go back to the same CMHD, he was able to convince the consultant that the problem was with me, not with him. 
and they all believe that unfortunately or fortunately i don't know i don't know what to say about it. even now you know when i think about it i say what a bloody thing to do for for i mean i'm an old, i'm i'm not a young person to have imagination things like that i only go by what i see and all the evidence was given in written format in a4 sheets all that was thrown away i don't know what those those, those com- notes from me are in the in the case notes or not one of these days i must I must go and have a look at the case notes what's what's actually been written down there about this boys uh, set up you see so it is all i mean i can say without any doubt the fault is on their side and as i said uh, even after that there is no structure there was nothing to say that your son will be looked after by so and so nothing of that sort you know so it it it, it is uh, i can't even talk about it it's so bad it is to think about it's upsetting is it Up- upsetting means you um, not to realize that whatever we are saying all i mean the, the cmht was went off for more than a year we, we made about five visits to them and then uh, they didn't take any notice I, i want to come back to that because i think you're making some very important points there but i want to go back to the actual incident in the bathroom mm-hmm. um did, did you were you talking to him through the locked bathroom door no 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 no, no. I, well we knocked on the door we when he, when he spoke it was a, such a squeaky voice i knew there was something wrong but i didn't realize it was he had damaged his uh, vocal cords but then when i went in and saw him you know uh, it was all apparent you see the bath was overflowing he had opened the hot water tap and you know and the blood was so mixed with the water and he's pink in color and everything else you see so i had to and the, the worst thing of that is my wife had to look at his you know throat in that condition she had to hold him uh, with a towel because i had to go and she wouldn't be able to she wasn't able to call the emergency services i had to ask her to put the towel around his neck and hold him and i went and called uh, for the ambulance and then I think uh, he was taken to um, um medical hospital in croydon and and you managed to save him by um coming in through the bathroom window absolutely Yeah so this must have been very distressing for you well I, fortunately i am that way a bit strong i was looking at it from a clinician's point of view i managed somehow to divorce myself as a father i was looking at him like as a doctor would look at a patient and i was i even now i'm able to, i have that capacity to do even the last time about a year ago when he did it i had the same uh, same attitude so i'm deal with deal with that easily in the other previous case i mean the first time of course the air ambulance came along you see and the fellow just dressed up the wound and everything and then after that only he was taken to the mayday hospital so he what what he done was he attempted to cut his throat with a knife is that right yeah he had not one knife so many knives in the bathroom yeah even the last time he had six seven knives in the in last year when he did it this time of course he stabbed himself in the, in the throat three or four times he didn't slit it right across you see so uh, uh same thing he tried again i suppose he said he was trying to find the jugular vein he couldn't uh, and that second incident he locked himself in the bathroom again as well that 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 uh, partly so forward whatever he was in a he was a living with us and uh, um he was in a funny strange sort of mood but this comes and goes so we didn't take much care of it we had to go and visit a friend in france who was very dear to us and they couldn't come over here because they didn't have a visa they had come from india so we went there for 3 days we went on the on thursday and uh, we came back on the saturday when we came back uh, the medicine medication was being handled by an agency they used to come in the evening and give it and go so when i came back the house was in darkness i knew straight away there's something wrong because ravi always sleeps with the with the lights on doesn't matter what time of day it is so when i looked up at the top floor where his, his room is there was no light so i ran up there to see he was flat on the back pale as anything you know his whole face was almost white and uh, smell of blood congealed blood all over the place you know uh, it the whole bathroom was congealed with blood. and there are some towels soaked in blood and I said what what's the matter ravi and he pointed to his neck and he saw the four four wounds uh, i said what did you do and he started this and that i said um anyway 
um, my first thing I did was get my wife to do make something for him to eat because he must have not eat. He must have done this on the Friday night because the blood was so congealed, you see. So it had to have happened the previous day. So my wife made something for him to eat and we called the ambulance and were taken again back to A and A. He went to St. Helia that day. So that's what happened the second time. Um, fortunately, by the time we came, blood, the blood has, was not, uh, you know, it, the wounds had more or less closed and he wasn't bleeding anymore. So there was only very little blood in him. The, his pulse was about, pulse was about 120, 230. I suppose the heart was trying to keep up with the, a little bit of blood in his system, you see. Anyway. Uh, so on both occasions, mm. he, he was really lucky to be alive. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What psychiatric treatment um, has he been receiving, and what are your thoughts about it? You, as I said, in the, during the first time, he, they should have done something, given given some sort of therapy, or I mean, he has had he hasn't had any psychotherapy apart from one session with the, with the, with a very good doctor, but he he approached it him in a, di in a different way and he stirred him up a bit and he didn't want to go to the same man again but th that gentleman left for left for America for better um, some better appointment so he wasn't here anymore after that he has refused to have any psychotherapy at all I'm still trying to get him to do it this is after since 1995 Dr. Prasad I mean they, they the service they are not interested it looks like they have said they thought that this fellow is, uh, you know, he's in for the long haul. Just ignore him and leave him be. That's what seems to be the attitude. Because there's nothing in structured to get him, you know, at least partially recovered. Nothing of that sort. I don't know. My perception is without psychology, a mentally ill patient cannot recover to any extent. Just, you know, depending on pills. It just keeps this man at a certain maintenance level. That is the operation at the moment. He's on clozapine. He was on olanzapine and something else before. At the moment, he's having a little bit of aripiprazole and clozapine. So the only treatment he's really had, as far as you're concerned, is medication. Absolutely. Um, and and he, you mentioned before when we were talking before we began the interview that a community psychiatric nurse would turn up and give him an injection. Yes, yeah, and go away. And, and that would be it. That was haloperidol, you know. You know that's only a sleeping issue. <laughs> well, well, I can debate with you what haloperidol is, but I, I want I, I want to focus a little bit more on the fact which I'm yeah. finding quite shocking yeah. that the nurse just turned up, gave the injection, and wouldn't even talk to your son. Is that right? No, no, he she wouldn't talk to us without him being present. Right. right. That is a oh. funny thing because uh, 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 a fully trained nurse or psychiatrist or anybody who is dealing with a mentally ill patient knows when to talk to that patient whether the parent is there or not and know when to talk to the parent when the when the patient is there or not because my son doesn't like anything about him being told in his presence to anybody else he would tell me I told you that in perfect confidence why did you go and fucking tell that nurse about me he, I mean he started using these f-words then very in the very beginning as well when uh, before he actually committed, uh, tried to attempt a suicide, when he started using F word, you know, in Asian community, children don't use F words in front of parents. But that that was the start. I mean, I'm going back a bit now. Yeah, that, but okay, that, so that you're making a very important point there. But I want to go back to the point, which is another issue, which is that the team, the psychiatric team, mm -hmm. were not liaising with you properly. They no, would, no, they no. would probably plead confidentiality, and they mm -hmm. wouldn't converse with you. And you're Absolutely. a valuable source of information Absolutely. about the patient. Well, now they do. Now I send them emails about my son whenever I think they need a feedback. Now it's a different kettle of fish. Then it wasn't. This is okay. For, for 17 years ago, it wasn't at all, and even we were not given any trauma. My wife wasn't given any trauma counseling. They didn't. They didn't ask what. What do we? What do you need? How can we help you? Not yes. a thing. Yes. Yeah. That's terrible. Um, but listen, you, you, now they're paying attention. Is that right? They're absolutely, paying attention, absolutely. adequate attention to what you have to say. Oh yeah, because I know how to get the adequate attention. Okay, but but, but I am at the moment before I forget. I better mention this. 
But what about the new carrot? Does he know all these things? Yes, okay, that's a very good point. But listen, the, the, the mental illness that your son has been suffering from, your engagement with the services has been going on over, on, approaching 20 years, is that right? Mm -hmm. So, but is it in the last three or four years that they've been begun to pay attention to you? No, 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 May, maybe a little bit more, five, six years possibly. Okay, okay, I, but I really... Yeah, because I, I, when I, when I knew how to get all of the names from my trust, uh, the name, email addresses, I started using them willy-nilly, you see. And I got the right response, but okay. fortunately, fortunately, there were some consultants, excellent, absolutely excellent. But they did do most of them still believe that psychotherapy will not suit a, a schizophrenic. Okay, and you don't agree with that? No, 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 absolutely not. Well, it doesn't have to be psychotherapy, but one should at least talk to the patient. Uh, absolutely, that's, absolutely. But that's what, I, that's what I'm finding slightly perplexing, that they don't mm. seem to understand you have to talk to the patient. Exactly. And he's very homophobic. He doesn't like male clinicians around him. Extremely, All right. Extremely homophobic. Okay. But you said some of the consultant psychiatrists were excellent, but some were not then. Tell us yeah, a bit about the ones that were not. Especially the first one. He was a dead loss. He was absolute dead loss. Why do you say that? Because he didn't take anything we said as 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 uh, as the truth, you know. And you know, when he when I first met him after the suicide attempt, he said there was no sign of psychosis. And I wanted to tell the idiot, what about early warning signs that I showed you a year before he committed attempted suicide? What yes. were those early signs about? Yeah, that must have been very irritating for you to have Absolutely. that. Even comment. now, they don't pay attention to early signs. They don't know. What, they don't give a damn about early detection. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. I agree with you. It's terrible. Early detection is far more important than early intervention. Intervention is always after a psychotic episode. Yes, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, but listen, what's your advice to anyone listening to this who's a father or a, a sister or a mother or a brother of someone with a serious mental illness who's going through what you went through? What advice would you give them? Get as much information as possible. I mean, you know, listen to people like us who has been through the mill. How I mean, do they find people like you? Well, Clara Caras associations, Caras clubs, things like that. We get together and meet, and also ask them. In there, I mean, there is Google in it to help you quite a bit. Uh, what what reactions, the medication reactions? But the information on Google is very variable. A lot of it is I erroneous. Know it is. But some is good, isn't it? It's some. How do you know what's good and what isn't? Uh, that is also true. But then we go by experience, and now I, I can talk freely about this because I'm in order, and I know what it is, I've been okay. through the mill, I know it can happen again, Okay. but I have to be watchful. Yeah. Okay, so um, basically the advice for a carer is to make contact with other carers. Right, so, but experience. The, the problem is this, the carers must be informed by, before the patient gets out of the ward, when they have this... Uh, um, what do you call these meetings before before the person is leaving? Um, you know. Uh, well, the care planning meetings, discharge, care planning dis approach. Discharge planning meetings. Yes. Yes. Uh, e even before that, and my my view is this: when the patient gets into the ward, the, the carers must be invited from the very first day or the second day, or possible. I agree, but that doesn't happen, does it? That that is what I'm saying. This 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 is the thing. Yeah. So, and also at this discharge planning meetings, everything must be laid out, you know, uh, everything like the gospel. They must say everything that is about the patient, whether the, if, the, if it is necessary, say it in, in the absence of the patient. This is what is go, going on. This is the medication. This is how he may, he may react. This is what will happen if he, if, he, if he doesn't comply. You know, he could, he could become uh, 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 what they call uh, aggressive. If he doesn't take close up in for two days, you know what happens, don't you? Uh, those things might happen. These must be the warnings yeah. must be given. Warnings must be given to the patient's carers, and yeah. then they can take over. And also follow up when the patient is sent back home. Nowadays, as you know, because of scarcity of beds, they are sent back home when they are not yes. even ready. Yes, I agree. I agree. This is it. But these discharge planning meetings are often done very badly as well. This is it. Sometimes. The care is not present at these ward rounds. Yes. Yeah. I don't know why they call it a round. It's not a round anymore. It's, in, it's held in a yeah. little room. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and the standard is shockingly bad as well. Okay. But this, these things can be improved to a great extent. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I know. I do this AMS visit. I visit. I have visited about 50 acute wards in in my life since 19, 2007. You you have to explain what AMS is because yeah. most listeners would not know. Accreditation of inpatient mental health ward. It, okay. As I said, it is uh, uh, the wards are reviewed. Uh, they won't call it an inspection, but it's like the care quality commission. You see. We do it in a, in the a same similar sort of way. We and we meet the patients. We talk to the staff, everything else, and see how the how how the patients are cared for. And who and who's doing it though? Is it the Royal College of Psychiatrists Royal, Royal organization? College, Royal College of Psychiatrists. There will okay. be one carer, one service user, and possibly three clinicians. It could okay. be a, it could be a psychiatrist or somebody lower than that. So and we these are all. And these are all inpatient units you're looking at. Inpatient, yes. Acute and how many? How many have you looked at? I looked at about 50 so far. And what did you think about the standard overall? Some are absolutely out of this world. Fantastic. Well, and, what proportion? Ten uh, percent. Ah, that's a, that's a smaller proportion. Uh, maybe about ten percent. But okay. re recently there have been about six or seven wards that have got absolutely full marks on in every standard. You got three okay. standards. One so you think the standard is going up then recently? No, they're complying well. All right, but listen, standard if ten percent, if ten percent are good, hmm. how many, What percentage are really, really bad in your opinion? Uh, that's also a small percentage. About six or seven percent are bad. Okay. At how least, bad is bad? What's the worst thing you've well, seen? Well, some of them are as bad enough to be reported to the CQC. And have you done that? Um, I think in one case I've done. There's one recently that come up. I don't know whether they have actually reported it or not. We recommended. But it what made you? You obviously got to try and retain the anonymity of the ward in particular. What made no, you think it was no. bad? No, no, we 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 compare it against the standards. And yes, but what made you think this was particularly bad? Give me an example of what you saw that was particularly bad, uh, so that the, so that the listener would understand what you're getting at. Lig ligature points, for instance. Yeah. Right. That's it. And um, oh. And until I look at my notes, I can't say. Even right. their, by by their own submission, I mean the wards do their own reviews. Yeah. Okay. After okay. them, they come to us. Their own reviews, I said. You know. Okay. Uh, sometimes there's problem with the staff itself. Okay, but we're running out of time. So let me ask you finally about your son. How is your son now? Well, he's still having this certain certain uh, flare-ups in the sense that uh, about two two or three weeks ago. He was in the kitchen with my wife, and he, something happened, and he said he talked about she interfering with him sexually when some when he when he was small, when he was a child, and this this was stated by by him about six or seven years ago, and suddenly this came up again, and then he said I'm not going to stay here, I'm going away to the you know there is a halfway house about ten minutes walk from our house. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was um, he was um, given a place there to stay, mm -hmm. and uh, at the moment he's gone back there with with his stuff. You see, but he he comes comes home, um, and he has slightly improved. His, his mannerism is slightly improved. Okay, what do you think about the standard of treatment he's getting now? Uh, he, he he doesn't. The lady there doesn't believe that CBT helps him. She doesn't believe in CBT for mental okay. patients. So you and you don't agree with that? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Okay, so basically, Unless, you mean? Point, sorry, sorry. Point is, they must first try to see whether it works or not. I agree. How, I agree. how can you assume that everybody is the same? I agree. So, so, um, so basically, you're still not happy with the standard of treatment he's getting no, now. No, 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 not yet. There is okay. no set. There is no set program for him at all. Even yeah. now. Okay, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a slightly provocative and maybe rather difficult question. But clearly, um, looking after your son and wrestling with the serious mental illness has been very stressful. Yeah. But wrestling with the services has been stressful. So, which has been more stressful: dealing with the the, the services, which weren't very good a lot of the time, or dealing with the illness that your son had, which was more stressful? It is equal for me. I, I mean. I can I can go and now yesterday we were at a big yesterday or day before we were at a big meeting and the and the chief executive asked me asked asked us what what have we got right what have we haven't got right so yeah. we told them this exact same things I was telling you yeah that but, the patient is sent home without any warning 
But these are old stories. They've been going exactly. on for decades. Exactly. Exactly. He should he should know that by now. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. that's yeah. all. Anyway, I mean it's, the evidence it's, is there since yes. since the year dot. Yeah. If you're if you're having to tell him that again at, at this stage, that's ridiculous. Mm. <laughs> and anyway, listen, Nick. Um, many thanks indeed for um, talking to us and sharing your experiences. And um, I think that it, it's very important um, what you've had to say. And I hope that it will make a difference in terms of improving services for the future. So thank you very much indeed, Nick. Thank you. Where can you see this podcast? 